Okay, here's a question. Do you believe you have a personal responsibility to share your faith? Surveys have shown that the overwhelming majority of you would answer yes. Okay, so what about this question? Have you shared your faith with anyone in the last six months? Surveys have shown that a majority of you would answer this question? No. I guess it's just not as easy as it seems, or at least as easy as we'd like it to be. Well, here's another question. How many times have you personally invited an unchurched person to church? Now this seems simple, right? And yet, surveys tell us that almost half of you would answer zero. I mean, there are lots of reasons why we don't, right? Like, maybe it still feels a little awkward and uncomfortable, or maybe we're just unsure how effective it is, or we just expect to hear them say, well, no. Okay, so listen to this. When people are asked why they came to church in the first place, the vast majority of them say, I began attending because someone invited me. It wasn't the music or the pastor. It wasn't the child care, the youth program, or the building. Although these are all great things, important and valuable things, the main thing that got most of you up and through that door the first time wasn't any of these. It was an invitation. Easter will be here soon. It's the perfect Sunday to share with others what your faith is all about. And it can all start with one more simple question. Want to come to church on Sunday? Let's change the stats and let God change hearts and lives this Easter. And let's start with something simple, an invitation. All right. So there's the challenge coming up Easter weekend. Just a couple of weeks, we've got a, a Good Friday service that, that weekend. Um, and, and that's separate than the Easter service is going to be heavy on worship. Just always a great time so you can invite people to that. Then the Easter services, we've got one Saturday at 5 o'clock, which will be repeated the same as on Easter morning on Sunday, which is the 9-11. So just challenge you guys. This is the time you heard the video. People are, are more receptive. So let's get out of our comfort zones. Let's invite, invite, invite. So Absolutely. We're hoping to see a lot of first-time guests that weekend. And if this is your first time, um, we just want to say welcome. We have a couple special announcements for you. So first off, we have um, what we call new guest brochures. These are available at the information center. They just tell you about our church and there's also some coupons in here. Um, one is for a free drink and the other is for a free t-shirt from our bookstore. So grab one of these if this is your first time. Also, you'll notice we don't take an offering in service. Um, that's by design. We ask that you not give and just let this service be our gift to you. However, if you do call Oak Ridge your home and you wish to give, there are joy boxes throughout the campus, and there's also online giving available. And then lastly, we do not take communion in service, but there's a room right behind me called the Reflection Room where you can take communion, and that will be open all morning. Great. Um, this afternoon, we, over at 1.30, I know last week it got canceled um, because of that just crazy <laughs> blizzard that moved in, right, during the second service. Um, but at 1.30 over at the New City Campus, if you guys want to go check that out, even if you didn't sign up, I'd head over there. They're going to give some tours, and you can just kind of catch some vision and get pumped and excited about what's going to come and happen there um, this fall. Then uh, at 6 o'clock tonight, what starts up? We got, I know we canceled that as well. Yep. we got somebody ready to go there, <laughs> don't we? Uh -huh. We have an end service tonight. Got canceled canceled last week, but we're ready to go tonight, starting a brand new series all around tough questions. So we asked our youth, um, what are just some tough questions they wrestle with? And Josh and Tony and the pastors kind of reviewed them and picked the main topics that stood out. So we're going to be addressing those. It's always a super interesting series. So I would encourage everyone to just come check it out tonight at 6 p.m. All right, great. Then Wednesday night, I start a new toolbox class. Um, it's a two-week class this Wednesday and next week called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. We all go through some rough times. Jesus promised it, but he said, you know, I'm with us until the very end that he has overcome the world. So I would encourage you, um, even if you're going through a season that, that, that's a good season, and hopefully you are, um, but you can also use a lot of this information to help and, and comfort other people who might be going through a rough time. So if you go through that, you've, at the end of the two weeks, you get a book from Tim Kelly called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, um, original title that I copied for the class. Um, so I encourage you guys to do that. Then also Tom wanted me to mention the...
devotional books that he's mentioned on the Psalms. Um, Tim Keller, again, we're really plugging his books this week. Um, you can go and back, and they've got them back in stock in there. What, what's going on Friday? Do you not, do you no. not remember? <laughs> that, that, that's good. <laughs> Family Life Live event? Yeah. You know, yeah okay, there. Yeah, that, that, that's good. Uh-huh. Okay. Do you know anything about that, or you I want me to take no, that one? No, I do. Family okay. Life Live is our Easter service. Um, it's where kids take their um, parents to church. Yeah, there's actually going to be six, <laughs> seven, eight rooms set up, and, and really it's an interactive experience for you um, with your kids. You walk through each room with them. There's some hands-on crafts, some different ideas to help ingrain the Easter story, the most important story that could ever be told, the, the truth of, of our entire faith and and you guys get to come through that and then it, it during part of that presentation we're gonna we're gonna stop it where you can't go into all the rooms and we're all gonna come in here and hear a cool presentation and yep. sing a couple songs on that so Friday night sign up all these things that we mentioned you can sign up for online um, but take care of that and I do that what, what you had, you had mentioned that you were unless you're chicken it out you had I said was you had a tell joke. joke but the timing didn't seem right but I can do it now so. Is that why you were distracted and didn't quite know the Friday night thing, uh-huh. thinking of your joke? Okay, who here is a basketballer, loves the March Madness like myself? Woo. Okay, N- Not too joke. many. All right, all right. Yeah. What did March say to all the madness? Hey, what's all that bracket? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know what that is? That, Don't say sympathy that's claps. a sympathy no, clap. Not. That's totally a sympathy clap. Yes, it is. You guys pumped and ready to worship? All right. Why don't we stand up, say hello to somebody around you?
storm surrounded me, let it break at your name. Call the sea to still, the rage of me to still, every way at your name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Show of hands, any worriers in here? Anybody got any worriers? Yeah. You know, I, I tend, my default mode is to go to worry. And, um, and, and I need to constantly battle that and, and, and need to work on that a whole lot. And, you know, the Bible 
kind of gives a prescription for us us warriors, kind of tells us how we can battle that. And, and it's found in Philippians. The Apostle Paul was writing to a group of friends. They had given him a great gift. This letter was to encourage them, was to thank them for all that they had done for him. Um, and the theme, the main theme of this book, in a time when persecution was, was abundant, uh, the main theme of this book was joy. And, um, and, and Paul writes in this, and I, I think if, if you're a worrier in here, uh, take heart to this because he says, do not worry about anything. And, and I want to say to Paul, being a worrier, well, thanks a lot, Paul. That really helps a, a whole lot, you know, yeah. And if you ever, again, if you're a worrier and you have other people around you, they would just say, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And you think, that's what I'm trying to do. But Paul doesn't leave us there. He goes on, he says, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And he says, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I know what I have to work on is my default mode goes to all the what ifs. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if I don't do this? What, what if, what if, what if? And your mind can be consumed with that. And instead, we've got to change that. We've got to put that off and stop worrying. But the only way for us to do that is to replace it with prayer. And prayer isn't just some uh, superstitious, again, formula that can just, you know, all of a sudden erase worry. It's, it's a, an intimate conversation with our Father, with the creator of the universe, with the one that we just sang to, the one that has all these amazing attributes and the one that deeply cares about us, that can handle anything we give to him. As a matter of fact, that wants us to be vulnerable and wants us to understand that we cannot do it on ourselves, on our own strength, that we need to rely upon our God. So you get to take, I'm going to give you two, three minutes um, of just silence and where you can take to God all your petitions, all your problems, all your fears, and bring them to him and discuss them with him and let him speak to you in these, these few moments. So put off the worry and put on the prayer. Let's go to God. Father in heaven, um, we just come to you and, and we're grateful for who you are, for what you've done, and for the fact that you love us deeply. And Father, you know how we're made. 
you know that we need your help. You know that, that, that we are not strong enough on our own to go through this life, to face the problems, to face the, the fears and the worries that we have. And God, you tell us in scripture to, to stop worrying and to bring all of our cares, to bring all of our concerns, all of our problems, all of the things that we go through and that consume our minds, to bring them and lay them at your feet, to discuss them with you, to put them in your hands and to say, God, you need to take over. You need to act. You need to intervene. You need to give me wisdom. You need to give me guidance. You need to bring people, experts into my life that can help me in these areas. Father, as a community, help us to be a people that, that first goes to you. Rather than to all the what ifs, we go to the one who created all of this. And we are grateful, God, that, that you're not distant, that you are, we, we, we praise you for your power and for your might, but we also thank you that you're in the small, everyday things of our lives, that nothing uh, about us is, is, is unimportant to you that you care about every single thing we go through and that you want us to include you and to rely upon you in all these areas. So Father, I pray that over the last couple minutes as we've had time just to reflect, time to, to talk to you, we thank you that, that you've heard these prayers. But Father, I also pray that we understand that, that when we do that, that, that your peace guides our hearts and, and protects our minds in Christ Jesus, Father. And, and so I just thank you for that. And I pray that, that this becomes our habit. Not worry, uh, but prayer. Because you're a God who acts and a God who loves and a God who cares. We thank you. And I pray that you prepare our hearts for this message, God, that, that we, we don't just again hear these words, but we put these things into practice. And our life can become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, and impact this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He sang in the prison, and the walls came down. We're going to uh, s turn that into a song, okay? This half of the room is going to say, he sang in the prison, and this half is going to say, and the walls came down. Now, you say it. Ready? He sang in the prison, and the walls came down. All right, one more time. Sang in the prison, and the walls came down. Now, we're going to try and sing it, all right? We're going to make up our own song. Ready? And here's how it's going to go. He sang in the prison and the walls came down. Ready? He sang in the prison and the walls came down. All right. That doesn't mean anything to you at all, but we just wrote a new song, just so you know that. Now, I'm going to maybe ask somebody in the band or some of you to finish it after today's message. You can write the rest of the lyrics, what they should be. I've kind of given you the harmony. He sang in the prison and the walls came down. So if you're a guest here today or if you're new to church, this absolutely makes no sense to you, and I fully understand that, and we're okay with that. But it will make sense to you, I think, in 30 minutes. We're in this series called The Way, and here's where this came out of. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And the early followers of Jesus weren't called Christians. Uh, that was a term given to them by non-Christians later on. They were called followers of the way. And what was crazy about it was you could know a follower of the way by how they lived their life. So they're distinguishing characteristics of the people that were following Jesus. So we started this series of, uh, a couple weeks ago, and, and I tried to say, well, if somebody, would they know you're a follower of the way by how you lived your life? There should be some distinguishing characteristics. So the challenge was for those of you who follow Jesus, that you align yourself with how the people in the early church would have followed Jesus, because sometimes we can fade away from that, and there's a, a penalty to pay for that. That was first. And secondly, for those that don't know Jesus, that don't trust Jesus, that figure Jesus is a myth, to look and examine some of these teachings to see if maybe there's some power to them or maybe something that you've missed. So two weeks ago, we started off, we talked about, we read this verse. I'm going to read this. It's not up on the screen. I'm going to go through it like really fast, blazing speed. But this is a picture of the first church. And this is what we've used during this message. It's found in Acts 2, 42 through 47. It was described, it was, it was a descriptor of the followers of the way. And here's what it said. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. 
They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We're going to end in three weeks in Easter summarizing that whole thing. So we'll understand a lot more about it, uh, I think, in three more weeks. But for the first two weeks, we, we focused on a few things. First week one was we focused on the time, that the followers of the way used their time well. It says that, they, that daily they, mo- they met together. They thought about God daily. So I challenged you guys with a couple uh, things. First thing was investing small deposits of time over time is cum- cumulative. In other words, just small amounts of time over time, it adds up to something. So I challenge you with the devotionals. I challenge you with praying. I challenge you with listening to songs. I challenge you with your attendance here at church. And I still would. Followers of the way would watch those things. And if you say, well, I follow Jesus, but I don't do any of those things, I question whether you follow Jesus. I don't question whether you're saved. I just question whether you're following Jesus. I don't think people could identify you if you don't have some of these. uh, And this is not a harsh statement. It's just, look, let's, let's, let's look at it honestly. So they spent their time well. And they understood that these small deposits of time over time is cumulative. They also understood that neglect is cumulative. That if you neglect spending time with God, if you neglect singing to God, if you neglect reading his word, if you neglect gathering together, that it's cumulative as well. And it has negative uh, impacts on your walk with God. I had a person call me this week. They called me yesterday. And uh, they hadn't spoke to me for a couple years. And they, and they said, Tom, I'm struggling with my faith. And here's some things that have gone on. And I said, well, when was the last time that you were to gather with the body of Christ? When was the last time that you showed up? And she says, well, when our old church closed. Well, that was over 15 years ago. And I said, well, no wonder you've neglected your faith. And she says, well, I don't feel like I have any faith. I said, yeah, you probably don't, other than you believe that Jesus lived, died, and maybe rose from the dead. And now when the bottom's being pulled out from underneath you, there's no bedrock, there's no rock. You're, you've built a life on sand. And... Uh, there was nothing else to say to her. Now, I, I tried comforting her, tried to encourage her to get back into church, to get back in community, but otherwise her faith is going to get bashed around uh, if she's not spending time with God on a regular basis. Then the last thing I said about that was random has no cumulative value. So you might be here today and say, you know, I just feel like I needed to go to church, and you pop in now and then. You have already know what I'm saying is why you pop into churches now and then because you know that random has no cumulative value, meaning it helps for a little while, then it goes away. So if your church attendance is random, you come to church every Christmas and Easter, good luck. I just don't think it's going to build much faith, and I don't think people are going to identify you as a follower of Jesus very readily. Because random, and you already know this, when you randomly work out, when you randomly eat healthy, it has no cumulative value. And the negative to random is, for a lot of us, is we know we can miss something one or two times and it doesn't make a difference. You're correct, but it does lead to a habit. So that's, I think, your followers of the early church they understood their time. They, daily, they were, they were about God, and they met together regularly. Well, the second thing we learned right last week was that uh, they were filled with awe, and we talked about the power of awe, how it helps your body physically, emotionally, and so forth. And for those of you that weren't in the first service, you had a whole different experience leaving this room than we did in the second service. Second service, when we left this room, there was six inches of snow out there. It was unbelievable, seriously unbelievable. And... Uh, so, but awe is amazing and it's powerful. And when you look at God's creation, there's awe. When you think about God, there's awe. And awe is a good thing to have. And this early church had awe. So I challenge you guys to slow down. Look at some sunsets. Be awed by newborn babies, by somebody giving uh, tremendous amounts of grace, showing forgiveness, showing love. And that was a powerful deal. And then I made this statement. Following Jesus will make your life better and will make you better at life. And I believe that with all my heart. Following Jesus will make your life better and it'll make you better at life. It won't make you better than other people. It's not comparative. This is personal. But it'll make your life, my body, it'll make Tom, it'll make Tom's life better. And it'll make me better at life. It'll make me understand how to do things in life, how to handle things in life more. And that's what I want, not just for me. I want that for my children. And I want that for my children's children. And I want that from every one of you that's in this room, watching the hallway, watching online. I want you to have a better life. And I I think I can speak for God. I think he wants you to. Following Jesus will make your life better, will make you better at life. Well, today's part three of the way. And it's uh, this this message piggybacks off of awe from last week. If you missed it, 
You can go to oakbridgecc.com and watch that message. It's worth watching. So before we get into that uh, part of part three, the main teaching, I'm going to ask you guys some questions. How many of you guys are plant growers? You grow plants. Get them up high where I can see again. I can see plant growers. How many of you guys are plant tillers? Okay. Let's try this again. Plant growers, plant tillers. It's about even, all right? I fall into the category of a plant killer. I'm a plant killer. And uh, you know why? I, I do one of two things. Either I don't ever water it or either I drown it. It's one of the two. I never know what's the right amount. And so just a quick question. How do you know a plant's dying? How do you know it's plant's dying? I mean, you say, well, this is a no-duh, right? How do you know a plant's dying? You look at it, and it's starting to wilt. It's starting to change colors, and the color's not a good color. Or it's starting to dry up, fall off the vine, leaves are starting to drop. So but we've got plant killers and plant dyers, um, kill, plant killers and, and plant growers. So I'm going to kind of change with that idea. How do you know when a church is dying? Now, hold on. We know when a plant's dying. How do we know when a church is dying? I mean, let's just, this is all in the way, in the followers of the way. The way one of the church, the body of Christ, the believers in Christ to grow, how do they know a church is dying? Well, I give you the simplest way. Simple. This is so simple. And you already know this, and some of you have been part of a church that's dying or has died, and you know this, this is going to be so right. You quit seeing children. Can I say that again? How do you know a church is dying? You quit seeing children. So you walk in the parking lot, you can walk on any parking lot, and the parking lot may have plenty of cars, and if everybody walks in and there's no kids, that church is what? Dying. It's like a plant. If it starts to change colors, or if things start to dry up, it's dying. When a church has no children, or when it has no generations, it's dying. It's a dying church. Uh, children are the lifeblood of of a thriving church. Say that again for emphasis. Children are the lifeblood of a thriving church. Okay, let me show you some pictures. Just, just ones I like. I just picked out. Here's the first one. Maybe. <laughs> Tech booth, got any photos? No? No, no, no photos. All right. You didn't need to see them anyway. They're not a good. <laughs> I tell you what they were. There were pictures of, of all around our building here, of kids and families. What, what I uh, at times are concerned about is that you're in here, and you don't realize what's going on everywhere else in the church. See, if you come to our church, let's say you're 55, and the only experience you have with church is here. You don't see that there's between 250 and 400 kids involved that are fourth grade and down in our church. Meaning as many people as in here, they're in there. Okay. You don't see that. You don't see that uh, at night at 6 o'clock that we have uh, 300 students in here. That would be middle school, high school. You don't see over in the detour room, 5th and 6th graders, another 40. So you don't see that. Now, you can, if you walk on the parking lot, you'll see kids coming in. But you just don't see the full scope of that. Now, that's by design. Because we believe, certainly I believe, that children are what? The lifeblood of a thriving church. That's why we spend time on, on uh, our facilities for kids. That's why we spend time on, on finding great teachers for our kids. And if you're one of those, oh, there they go. Okay, you can <laughs> get them out of the way real quick where I don't hear, hear alls while I'm talking. You got another one? Keep going. Look at the teachers with them. Look at the generations that are represented. Keep going. Keep going. That, see, go back, no, no, don't go to this one. Wait, save that one. Go back to that one. See that one right there? That's Riley, the guy in the black standing. He's teaching those kids. That's one generation teaching the generation that comes behind, and it starts early. I think he's either a freshman or sophomore in high school. All right? Now, there's other teachers. We believe that in our church. If you want to know, well, gosh, why is our church thriving and growing? Because we believe children are the lifeblood of the church, children of the next generation behind us. So here's the question. Do you think that followers of the way knew this? What do you think? What do you think? Yeah. And how many of you guys have ever been a part of church that died? Anybody? Was, was there any kids left? 
No, I mean, it just kind of just phased out. So churches can be dying for a long time. And when they find out they're dying, it's almost too late. It's almost too late. You just got to, you just bury it and you just, hopefully a new church starts there or something. I mean, and I'm not trying to be harsh on that. There's churches that maybe that's just the cycle of their life, but that's the way it kind of goes. I'm going to read some scripture to you to show you the importance of my generation reaching the generation behind me, to show me the importance of the generation that is in front of me that's older than me of reaching me. And it goes on and on and on. A generation, by the way, by definition, is about 20 years. So, and there's intergeneration, meaning there's sub-generations within those generations. But you can imagine if you have people that are in your church from zero to age 80, we represent four or five generations. And the generation before them is supposed to reach the generation behind them. It's not really my job to actually reach my grandchildren now. It's the job of you guys. I mean, I'm, when I'm pointing to you guys, meaning you, you 15 to 25-year-olds. And it's not that we can't help and we're not part of that, but you're going to have the, the influence with them. You're going to have much more influence with them. So I just want to read some things that kind of lead into this followers of the way. And listen to this. It's fascinating. Psalm 7118. Psalm 7118. The psalmist wrote, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to who? Your mighty acts to all who are to come. God, don't let me leave. Don't walk away from me till I've told about this God, about who you are, to that next generation. The next generation. I spoke to um, a man this week, and he's older. And you know what I told him? I said, I want to run full steam into my tombstone telling people about the generation behind me about God. I mean, I don't want to walk into my grave. I don't want to just wither away. I want to go run full speed, hit the tombstone, go on the ground, and telling people about the generation about God behind me. And we've got so many of you that are that age that are like that. And that's such an encouragement. That is the lifeblood. You've caused the church to thrive because of that understanding. Psalm 145.4. One generation commends your works to another, they tell of your mighty acts. Let's see how God's saying this. One generation tells the next generation. Psalm 78, 5 through 7. Psalm 78, 5 through 7. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to what? To teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. Show that last picture that you showed that I said not to show. The little baby that was in the womb. Tech team, you up there again? That one. Isn't that beautiful? That's my unborn granddaughter. Bald little thing, I think. I'm not sure right now. To teach their children so the next generation would know them even the children yet to be born. And they, in turn, would tell their children, that little girl, I hope Oak Ridge is still strong and thriving, and I hope she tells her little girl about Jesus, about God. I, don't, I won't be there to see it, but I hope that's what goes on, and I hope Oak Ridge is still there to witness it, and you're part of that. Some of you will be. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds but would keep his commands. See, the early church understood this. When followers of the way got together, it wasn't an isolated group of men. It wasn't just an independent group of adults. I believe when followers of the way got together, I believe it was men, women, and children. And that's why I believe when persecution came against the way, it came against the family. I believe they separated moms and dads and they put them in prison. I, I believe they hauled children away. And I think that all the followers of the way understood this. Acts 2, 42 through 47. This is what I read at the very beginning, but this is just the beginning of it. They devoted themselves, talking about followers of the way, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. They were devoted to the teachings of God, to the leadings of God, to what Jesus had taught the apostles. They were devoted to that. They were devoted to that in community. So here's kind of the point one of where we start today. Education in community is invaluable. Let me say this again. And I'm talking about kids and generationally, and you as well. Education in community 
is invaluable. The early church understood that education, apostles' teaching, together in fellowship, is invaluable. That was part of the early church. That's why I love it when we see families come in here. And it might be a family of a, a grandma and a grandchild that just comes in. It might be a niece and an aunt that comes in. But I love it when families come in because that tells me it's a thriving church. It's what's supposed to be. We try to create environments that are specifically uh, beneficial to certain age groups. That's why we tell you to come to the edge at night to bring a kid. It's so critical to their walk. Education in community is invaluable. Education in community is invaluable. It's not just education. It's education together is invaluable. I got a, just a question for you. Uh, I've been pastoring now in some way, shape, or form over 20 years. And uh, wouldn't you think, I've got two children, they're 31 and 26, and uh, wouldn't you think that uh, we had family devotionals all the time? Raise your hand if you say yes. Raise your hand if you say no. The no's would win. We didn't. I mean, you think, well, Tom, didn't you just like, like gather everybody around the table and say, well, Matt, Katie, you pick one of the scripture verses today. Let's open the Bible and read it. We didn't. Now, I'm saying that's a good thing, but we didn't do it. You know how, you know how we taught our kids about this God? They came to church, and they had education and community, and they learned at their age-appropriate levels. And when they came home, we talked to them about that. What did you learn? What went on? What happened? And then we prayed with them. We did pray with them regularly every day. That was the one thing Kathy did a great job with. But we prayed with them. My children came to hear about Jesus, the great works of God, through this education in community. And you know what? It's so important. You're, you're just all a part of it. Every, every dollar you give to the church, by the way, helps keep this going where we can tell the next generation, you know, about Jesus. That's one of the reasons I'm excited about Oak Bridge City. I think there's a whole group of people in the city, a whole generation that's missing God and Jesus. And if we don't step in and do something about it, they'll miss them. And then that generation won't be able to say to the next generation. And that generation won't say to the next generation. And then the church is what? The followers of the way are what? They're gone. They're gone. All right. So here's another point I want to make. That education in community is invaluable. But education alone is not enough. Let me say it this way. If, if all you're doing is learning about Scripture, you can get puffed up at times. In other words, if all you're trying to do is, is saturate your mind with, with uh, Scripture, without this other thing I'm going to talk about, it's not as powerful. So this second part, I think the early church understood. And here's what it is. Education without, and you've got to listen to this, exaltation, Education without exaltation is not enough. You have to have exaltation along with education to teach the grandeur of God. Now, is that too confusing for you? Okay, I had to write it like five different times after I uh, after I had to read it five different times after I wrote it to make sure what I was saying was what I thought. Education without exaltation is not enough to teach the grandeur of God. You can teach Scripture, but there has to be exaltation of God to go along with it for it to sink in. Okay, here's my case for you. At the end of this Acts 2, 42 through 47, which we read at the beginning, it said they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. Now, early on, it had said simply that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they had apostles' teaching that they were teaching, and at the end, they had this praising of God together. These two merged. They're only a few sentences apart. A lot of churches you go to, and all they talk about is education. There, I'm, I'm very careful because I find those churches that sometimes lean towards being judgmental. Then if I go to some churches and all they talk about is exaltation or praising God, then I, I'm very careful those churches because they seem to be overly emotional. Not really talking about God, but feelings all the time. I think the proper way in the early church was they had, they had education with exaltation, and that lead to teaching the grandeur of God. Here's what exalt means, to hold in high regard. And here's what praise means, to express admiration for. So the more you learn about God through Scripture, 
you hold him in high regard. But when you're able to sing to this God, that, that takes this education and it gives it power in your life. Okay. Psalm 102, 18. Psalm 102, 18. Here's what the psalmist wrote. Let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may what? Say it. Praise the Lord. So we just read about the psalmist before about teaching generations. And now he says, let this be written for that, so those generations that they understand praising the Lord is important. I love this about followers of the way. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with gladness in their hearts. And they praised God and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. I just glossed over something really quick. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with what? Glad and sincere hearts. I think part of this praising leads to glad and sincere hearts. Okay. Education with exaltation is critical. It leads to glad and sincere hearts. Helps us. There's three reasons why I'm going to tell you this, and this you've got to lean into now. How many of you guys love to sing? Let's be totally honest right now. Raise your hand. How many of you guys... That's not your deal. Raise your hand. Anybody would be willing to say it right now? Okay, that's you. I'm going to push on you to sing. I'm going to push on some of you that are singing. I'm going to explain why, why you enjoy it. And you may already know these things. Here's the first one. Three things. Singing helps us remember the truths of God. Singing helps us remember the truths of God. In other words... A lot of the songs we sing, they're from Scripture. You're able to memorize it well. You know what they say about Alzheimer's people? They forget the names of the people who they love most, but they can sing entire songs. It's one of the best teaching methods there is. How do you teach little kids? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible. Keep going. Okay, you can stop. That's good enough. <laughs> now, could you tell me what Colossians 3.16 is? No, all right? Here's Colossians 3.16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. Can you believe this? They taught through songs. Do you want to know why music is so critical to us? In every component, every component, the kids, all those kids, they'll rotate to a room. And do you know what they'll do? They'll sing. They'll sing songs about the grandeur of God, coupled with education about what God's word teaches. And there's power to that. It's amazing. It helps them to remember God's word. For some of you, that's why you love music. You say, yes, this is so true. And it's based on the teachings of Scripture. So it's an important thing. I believe the early church follows way. I think they sang a lot. I think they sang with their kids a lot. I think they te teenagers sang a lot. All right, second point. Singing to God engages us in emotionally healthy ways. Second point. Singing to God engages us in emotionally healthy ways. Let me give an example. 1 Samuel 16, 23. This is from the Bible. Whenever the spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre, his harp, and he would play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. So whenever the Saul got down, whenever he got where he felt wrong, where he didn't feel right, David would come in and sing to him, and music helped him feel better. Now let me just ask you, has music ever helped you feel better? Has it ever helped your emotions? Have you ever sang a song in here and tears started to roll down, but there were good tears other than they ruined your mascara? There's nothing wrong with it. It was a good tear. It was a healthy, cleansing flow. God did something. A wide variety of songs in the church, and we try and sing a wide variety of songs here. A wide variety of songs helps us with awe, reverence, repentance, grief, joy, confidence, celebration, love, freedom, the, for, for the freedom of the Lord is. Anybody, right? You can sing song after song. These things make a difference. And what I'm trying to tell you is that's part of what we do corporately when we gather together. That is followers of the way they did that. They sang songs regularly. It was part of their worship. 
And if you miss that, if you're a person that says, well, our church just doesn't do that, I just think that you're missing so much of what God has for you. Singing at all age groups. Tonight we'll have the edge. I already know what their music is. I can't wait to sing it again tonight because I know it's going to do something to my heart. The songs that talk about grief, even if. It's going to touch me. Talks, songs that talk about repent, follow God, get back in the game. They're going to touch me. God uses these songs, by the way, to often break through the hardness of our hearts. If you're a person here today and you said, I've never been to church before, sometimes God will use a song to touch your heart. And I think you know that already. I think you know that. All right, here's the third thing as I round up to the home stretch. Singing praise helps us to d demonstrate and express unity in Christ. Park on this for a second. Singing praise to God helps us to demonstrate and express our unity together. All right. Have any of you guys ever sang Take Me Out to the Ball Game? Raise your hand if you have. Don't you feel like you're part of a Cardinal fan when you sing that? Take me out to the... Right, you're a Cardinal fan. So you sing it together, and all of a sudden you feel unified when you're at a game when you sing that. I tell you one of the reasons that nobody said it, but this, this is a true thing. Do you know why there's so much controversy about the national anthem? It's supposed to be a unifier when we sing it. And instead now it's been what? But see, when you sing the national anthem, it's supposed to be a unifier. That's why we sing. It binds us together. I never feel closer to you than when we're singing to him together. Can I say it again? I never feel closer to you than we're singing to him together. When I, I get the opportunity to go down to Big Stuff, which is a summer camp for uh, high school students, I never feel closer to those 250 students that we come down with than when we're singing to him. We are unified. That song brings unity. I believe that Fathers of the Way had to have unity. And I believe they sang because of that, that they were praising God. I believe because they praised God that they had glad and sincere hearts. Even when things were going against them, I think it made a huge difference. That's the point I want to hit home. No matter what you're going through, we do funerals. I do funerals. I've had a couple this past week. And uh, it was funny. Um, when we sing together, that's when we feel like we're one. Even when the person that I know, they're experiencing the most grief, I can lean into that. I will tell you one funeral that I did not too long ago, and this just popped into my mind. It was a guy roughly my age. He died, and we sang together. And the mom, the closing song she picked, and she's a Christian, was take me out to the ball game because he was a Cardinal fan. Now, that put a smile on our face. In the midst of heavy grief, in the midst of heavy grief, uh, did a funeral the other day, and the final closing song was uh, Off into the Wild Blue Yonder. You know, the military song. Dun, 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 whatever it goes like that. A unifier. Education with exaltation, centered around God, brings glad and sincere hearts, even in spite of wherever you're at. He sang in the prison, and the walls came down. You guys sang that? Try it again. Ready? He sang in the prison. Acts 16, 25 through 26. As I close, about midnight, Paul and Silas we're praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Now, before I keep reading, they were imprisoned falsely. Where they're at wasn't a good place. They were there a long time. Situation wasn't good. Paul, who was a follower of the way, wanted to tell everybody about Jesus and the great works of God. 
He couldn't go outside of these prison walls. So he decided, you know what? I'm just going to sing to those people that are right there. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them like they had a choice, huh? Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, all the prison doors flew open. And everyone's chains came loose. What prison are you in today? Relationally? Addicted? Addictions? Health? That you didn't find yourself ever being there. That God would say, I know it doesn't make sense. Because there's something inside of you that's not good that wants to blame me. But maybe... In this season of life where it seems unjust and unfair, maybe if you sing in the prison, those walls might come down. Maybe a glad and sincere heart will replace a bitter and sad one. See, that's the theme of Scripture. That's how these followers of the way could take hit after hit after hit by the government, by religious leaders, by their family kicking them out, how their family could be divided. And they still had glad and sincere hearts. They sang in the prison. And the walls came down. And that's the power of God as he inhabits our praise. And as he does something in our hearts that we can't fully understand. But we can't deny. God, I pray for the people today. I thank you that this early church taught us about time. And we learned about awe, awe of you. And that's coupled with praise of you. We learn your teaching. We learn education about what you'd have us do, how Jesus lived. And we combine that with exaltation. And that teaches us your word. And it gives us sincere hearts, humble, glad hearts, in spite of the circumstances. God, these times where we sing, you enter our hearts deeply. You touch our souls. You transform our minds. When we sing in the prison, oftentimes our walls come down. God, I thank you that we have a few minutes more to maybe do exactly why you brought us here today. To sing to you and invite you into our hearts. To invite you into our prison. If we're in that season of life or that time. God, we exalt you. There is no other name before you. We give you full sway to touch us in these moments. Father, we love you and we thank you. May this be a holy moment unto you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Please stand and sing.
We're not done yet. I want to encourage you. He sang in the prison and the walls came down. If you're a teenager right now, you've come from a busted home. A home that uh, you've just felt not what it should be. You felt in the prison of maybe loneliness or despair or regret. You sing to this God, you exalt this God, and this God can change things. If you're a person that's just said, I want to be in a relationship, I feel so lonely. You sing to this God, you praise to this God, and the walls can come down. It may not change the situation, but God changes your heart. He can give you a glad and sincere heart. If you just had a health report, that it seems like the, the prison just came around you. You exalt God. If you're in a, an abusive relationship and you know no way out, it seems like it's just that hard. You exalt God and you praise God. If you've lost your job and you're struggling financially, you exalt God and you praise God and the walls can come down. If you're struggling with a problem that's bigger than you, exalt God and praise God. What we do over this next few minutes, if we allow ourselves to understand who we're singing to, if we combine education of knowing who God is with exaltation, he says, I can bring walls down. I can change things. You may not see it this moment, but you can see it soon. So we want to sing together. We want to all together, not, not I exalt thee, but we exalt thee together. All of us, let's sing to the king and end with this way.
louder. Maybe we don't need Tylenol. <laughs> Maybe we don't need some of the medicines that we reach for. Not knocking them. But maybe it's education with exaltation that would bring us glad and sincere hearts when we're struggling with legitimate hurt, legitimate loss. Maybe those followers of the waste say, bring it on. Bring it on. I know how to exalt my God. I know how to sing songs of praise that Jesus taught. And I'll sing in my prison, and the walls will come down. See you guys next week. Thanks for coming.